My name is Amy Kane. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am the equity officer for the city of Boulder. So I think those of you who are um, here in person, we also are having folks uh, participate online. We've got interpretation services this evening, so we do ask that our panelists or our candidates speak slowly in answering the questions. I will try and do the same. So we'll just try and keep, keep each other on track with that. Um, we've had uh, several questions that were submitted in advance. For participants who are in the room, we have note cards and pens if you would like to submit a question as we are hosting our session this evening. You feel free to get raise your hand and Amy McMahon will come and help gather those questions from you. For our online audience, if you will just put your questions in the Q&A portion of the Zoom link, um, then we will be able to capture those questions as well. So with that, I think we'll get started. Are our candidates ready? Yep, okay. So the first question that we ask, and we're gonna ask you to spend about three minutes per question answering the questions. If you could please introduce yourself, why you're interested in this position, and why did you get into police oversight? And Tanya, if you would be willing to answer first, that would be amazing. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. My name is Tanya McClary, and I live in Dallas, Texas. Uh, right now, I'm the very first police monitor for the city of Dallas, and also the director of the Office of Community Police Oversight. Um, and so it, we started, the office opened up in October of 2019 and I got hired and started that last week of February of 2020 and then about a month later the world was in a pandemic. <laughs> so literally almost my entire time as a police monitor has been um, in a pandemic. And so uh, prior to coming to Dallas, I worked in New Orleans as the chief monitor. So, and I was the chief monitor over use of force. So I also started that department for the office. And so, of course, you can imagine that's a very tough office because the use of force cases are normally the ones that get the police department on the front page of newspapers. And so uh, really trying to uh, work with the police department and, and, and the community around very, very serious cases um, has come up. And so um, for me, and also just to give you context too, and so um, even though New Orleans is, is um, a smaller city per se, because of its popularity, we have like millions of people that come through there all the time. So there were always just not only the citizens of um, New Orleans that would interact with the police, but we also had a lot of visitors to the city. And Dallas is the eighth largest police department in the country. And so um, I've had a lot of practice in working. And so one of the things that was exciting to me about Boulder is that it's a smaller department. And so what would that look like? Like, what would be the ability to come and be the police monitor in a city that is small but also has a lot of significance? So you have the university here, you have other dynamics. And so what would it mean to be able to work with a department where you could potentially be able to um, work with them more closely? So for example, in Dallas, it's 3,500 officers. So some patrol officers still don't even know who we are. They don't even know that an office exists. And the same thing with the community. I'm still meeting people now in 2023 that are like, oh my God, we have an Office of Community Police Oversight. And so what does that mean? And also in the context of a city that um, has smaller populations of communities of color. What are we seeing here in Boulder? What are the impacts on those communities and how are, um, they being addressed and so for me that's what's really exciting about it the possibility of being really more hands-on with the community with the police department to see if we can make real impact thank you tanya and just on the the last bit of that question because it's a long one is why did you get into police oversight so I got into police oversight, so my background is I, I call myself an activist lawyer. So I probably spent just as much of my time being an activist, literal community activist, as I have lawyering. And when I did lawyering, I was a criminal defense lawyer. I was a public defender for my entire career. And so as a public defender, you see policing kind of differently uh, because I'm seeing the impact of policing on my clients' cases and things of that nature. But the organizing work that I did was all around criminal justice and so policies, and other things, and so um, policing was a part of that. I had a chance to work with different coalitions across the country, and also even national police organizations around what are the best 
things about policing and what are the worst things and how do we bring that together. So I think, you know, criminal justice is just in my bones. And so I think it was kind of natural that I started this progression of actually working more closely with community and police departments, um, kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Beautiful, thank you. Chris? Yeah, hi, my name is Chris Dewar. I live in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, yeah, I will, I will try to speak slowly, it's a challenge. Uh, thank you everyone that came out here today, people that are in the room, uh, that took the time. Uh, there's some, some young uh, adolescents in the back. I think that that's great that, that the youth are participating in this process. And thank you everyone who's tuning in online. Uh, this is, uh, it's really important to have that community engagement and I'm, I'm very grateful to, to, have, to be a part of this. Um, I, my background is with the Civilian Complaint Review Board. That's the oversight agency um, that looks after or investigates allegations of misconduct of the NYPD. It's the country's largest oversight agency. And I spent 17 years there. I'm originally from Michigan, and I moved from Michigan to New York to take that job in 2003. And um, over, over my time there, uh, I uh, you know, started as an entry-level investigator and uh, there was a two-year commitment. You know, I was a, an economics major um, at the University of Michigan, but I had an interest in, in getting involved in investigative journalism. And in order to move from Michigan to New York, I, I needed a job, and you couldn't just apply to become an investigative journalist. So I was looking for jobs that were related, and I found the CCRB, which really marketed itself to recent college graduates uh, with an interest in um, the law, journalism, criminal justice, and that really spoke to me. So I went for what was supposed to be a two-year commitment, and quickly after I was there, I realized that I loved the work. And so, you know, if, if I was going to move on in two years to, you know, graduate school or law school or journalism school or try to get into journalism, I would have to kind of start planning my exit. It's just right when I was getting into the thick of having a full caseload. So I, in my mind, I made it a, a three-year commitment, and then. Before I knew it, you know, I was there 17 years. So over that time, yeah, I worked in all different capacities, um, investigated all types of cases. I was a supervising investigator. I was asked to help start the administrative prosecution unit, which was the first in the country of its kind, where civilians would prosecute the cases in which the CCRB found misconduct. And I helped to get that unit up and going by running the investigations team within the prosecu prosecution unit. Um, so that was, that was a few years, and then I went back to investigations, and eventually, by the time I left, I was the deputy executive director and chief of investigations, uh, overseeing about 120 investigators, you know, give or take any, you know, five or 10 at any given time. Um, like I said, I, I investigated or oversaw all manner of cases, high profile cases. Maybe the, the one that uh, some of you may have heard of uh, was the, the tragic case of Eric Garner. Um, uh, he, it's, it's a shame that we have to refer to it this way, but that was the first you know, public um, I, I can't breathe case. Um, and it was uh, the, the officer that was um, that committed the choco, Daniel Pantaleo, uh, eventually was taken to trial by the CCRB's APU unit. Um, so, the, you know, that's just to speak to, you know, the, the level of cases that I saw there. Um, I left the CCRB uh, at the end of 2020, and in the time since then, I've been working uh, in television and uh, film production and development as a researcher and as a uh, production uh, manager in terms of booking, they call it a booking producer, which is, uh, I've ended up working on a lot of true crime TV shows, and uh, my job, they're almost all murder cases, so it's going out and finding uh, the detectives that investigated the case, talking to them about their good work, trying to get them to be part of uh, the show, and then if they do so, the really hard part of the job then is to find and, and connect with the uh, victims. And I, I, you know, obviously the, the primary victims are dead because they've been murdered, but the family members survive and they are victims too, the family and friends. And uh, so I've been engaged still in, in sort of a type of, of, 
of work that I did before, um, but it's been it's been very powerful uh, in terms of learning a whole other level of empathy and speaking with those people. And I got interested in this position because after being away from you know working specifically in oversight for a number of years, I had a, a real big perspective change um, through a theater project that I got involved with, which hopefully I'll be able to to tell you more about later. But essentially, it it was a theater project that brought civilians and officers from the NYPD together uh, in order to better understand one another with the hopes that they would learn what it's like to walk a mile in the shoes of the other person. And it was a 10 week program. And um, I, it was the 10th season this past fall that I got ch chosen to be a part of it. And uh, by the end, I just, it, it was transformative and it, and it really um, changed the way that I saw the power of, of you know, getting community and officers to actually see each other in a different way, that it is possible. And it reinvigorated me and made me wanna use the expertise that I had gained uh, over time to, to put it to good use. And I saw this opportunity at the right time, the, the opportunity in Boulder, and it seemed you know, not just the right time, but the right opportunity in terms of, you know, um, like Tanya was saying, you know, to work in a, in a new place where you can have direct impact and make a difference instead of trying to correct things that have been in place for a long time. Um, it, it's something that I would like to be a part of in terms of if, you know, helping to, to formulate a, an office. Thank you. One request from our Zoom technicians is that you also bring the microphone closer to you all when you speak. So thank you for that. So Sherry, just got that message. So. Could you not hear me? I, we could. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hoping the Zoom audience could as well. Um, thank you again. It's great to see people who are interested in police oversight when they could be enjoying a beautiful day outside in Boulder. Um, my name is Sherry Down, and I'm going to answer the question of how did I get involved in police oversight, and it was not as calculated as my panelists. My first job as an attorney, my first day on my first job as an attorney, when I thought that I would be filling out paperwork, my boss basically grabbed me as soon as I walked into the door and said, we're going to the penitentiary and interviewing a man on death row. So that was my entree into police oversight. Um, that project was the biggest project that I worked on as an attorney. It was the investigation of John Burge. He's a notorious police commander in Chicago who um, allegations over the decades that he worked for Chicago were that he was he and his crew of detectives were coercing and torturing confessions out of arrestees in in high profile cases and most of those arrestees and all of the ones that I worked on you know were poor mostly young black men so that's the project that I worked on for almost the entirety of my legal career and then the next step into police misconduct was I was hired as an investigator for the city of Chicago. Um, our careers sound somewhat similarly. I worked as an investigator and as a supervisor of misconduct investigations, and now I work as a director of investigations. I manage currently the intake unit in Chicago. My unit involves direct supervision of 16 staff, and we process over 5,000 complaints of misconduct annually. We make jurisdictional determinations between my office, the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, and the CPD's Bureau of Internal Affairs. So when we have cases that fall within our jurisdiction, my investigative staff also conducts the preliminary investigation. Um, but throughout the course of my, my tenure at at COPA and working for the city investigating police misconduct, I've also worked on basically every type of case that we have jurisdiction over. Um, Officer-involved shootings, officer-involved deaths, excessive force, search and seizure allegations. I spent several years working on the domestic violence team as both an investigator and a supervisor, and in those instances, we investigated allegations that members of the Chicago police officer, or police office, were um, committing domestic violence crimes against their partners, um, children, or um, elderly members of their family who they were taking care of. Um, uh, also, 
one of the things that I have done is investigated every single aspect from the very beginning of cases all the way through the end. So that involves you know, taking statements of civilians, statements of officers, witnesses, collecting evidence. We have direct access in Chicago to almost all of the Chicago Police Department's reports and um, making assessments of the evidence, analyzing case law, looking at the Chicago Police Department's rules and regulations, um, making findings, determinations, and then finally recommending discipline. Additionally, Chicago, since I've been working there, we have directly responded to what would be called critical incidents. So in the course of my time there, I responded on scene to officer-involved shootings and officer-involved deaths, and I estimate that from my on-call response to cases that I worked on through the final stages of investigation that I have investigated in excess of 100 police-involved shootings. Um, why do I want to work at Boulder? Well, uh, I did have a time in the bicycle advocacy community, and <laughs> it's very different than police accountability. Uh, but Boulder, from my view in Chicago, is always on the top list of best places to bicycle, best, com best um, highest numbers of commuters. So it actually had this sort of halo of magic over it um, from years ago. And then I, I came out to visit in 2012 to experience it firsthand. And it's been basically one of my top vacation destinations, especially now that my brother lives in, lives in Boulder. Um, and as the two of you already said, I feel like I'm going to repeat myself, but absolutely, you know, the ability to work in a community that cares so much about police oversight, where it's not baked in, where there's still room for change, and there's so much engagement and thoughtfulness from both the community and the city, it's just an amazing opportunity. And I'm really thankful to be here in front of you. Thank you, Sherry. I'm going to ask to make sure everybody's microphones are on and that there's a green light at the bottom. Is everybody turned on? Do you see the green light on the side? OK. Make sure you also really connect in the mic I'm hearing from the tech team that a couple of you are a little low, which is hard for the Zoom folks. All right, on to the next question. In the past two years, Four, this is a question that was generated from community. In the past two years, four police oversight members have quit or resigned, plus one quit in protest. The previous monitor interviewed for another position before going to accept an out-of-state job. What is your plan to rebuild a sense of hope and revitalize this mission? And Sherry, I'll go ahead and ask you to start on this one. Thank you. Uh, I tried to follow the, uh, the situation as it unfolded in, in Boulder involving the um, police oversight panel. And it certainly seems to be a situation that has a lot of public interest, which is a testament to how much people in Boulder care about effective police oversight. Um, I don't know that there is, I don't know that there's a lack of momentum based on my perception as an outsider. But certainly, it is issues that need to be handled. I know that there is work that both the, that the oversight panel members are doing to try to adapt the ordinance that authorizes both the police oversight panel and the independent police monitor's position. I, again, I don't know that there is a lack of, 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 of community and city interest. It seems like people are very invested in it. I think people just need to see it, see this process work. And part of that is just having a monitor who's out in the community and is doing the work that needs to be done um, for the community of Boulder so that the, the residents of Boulder can uh, expect the constitutional and respectful policing that they deserve. Thank you. Tanya? Would you mind just repeating the question? My pleasure. In the past two years, four police oversight members have quit or resigned, plus one quit in protest. The previous monitor interviewed for another position to accept an out-of-state job. What is your plan to rebuild a sense of hope and revitalize the mission? 
So I'm going to have to piggyback on some of what my uh, fellow colleagues stated is that I think a lot of us going to kind of be walking the road. Um, we also have a, um, an oversight board in Dallas, and we've had members leave. Um, sometimes they've left because they haven't agreed with oversight, which I never understood why they were on the panel in the first place. Um, because I don't think you have to be like monolithic in its thinking, but you know, it would be nice to have people that actually supported oversight, right, and wanted to help us get better. Uh, we also had members that left kind of in protest and felt like the city wasn't doing um, as much as it should. So I actually have experience with, with those kind of issues. I mean, how I've dealt with it in um, Dallas is to really, um, when the new board members come on, is I really do an orientation with them. I really talk to them about things to expect. Um, I talk with city leaders about how important it is to show that you support this board, um, how important it is to make sure that they have the resources that they need. Because people, even though I'm the director of the office, people are always excited when the board is making recommendations when the board is out front and in the public. And so just ensuring that, um, that the board feels that it has what it needs to be the front facing part of um, this oversight battle here in Boulder. And so I think it's really just gonna be doing that. It's really gonna be working with the board very closely, working with city leadership to ensure, and then also really encouraging the board to do a lot of community engagement um, so that we are really hearing on the ground what the issues are, not just certain parts of Boulder, but um, the full community. And so what, what does that look like and how do we do that and how are we ensuring that all voices are getting in the room? Like I said, it's not about agreeing, but it's about hearing what the concerns are, but also hearing what's going right. It'd be nice for the panel to hear that in this part of Boulder, they like how police are working because it's helping their community. And so how do we address concerns and then how do we reinforce things that are positive and happening in the community? Thank you. Chris? Yes, thank you. Um, I think that, you know, the way that the, the question is posed, one might take away this idea if, if you weren't familiar with, with what was happening here or in full context that, wow, this sounds really chaotic and it sounds like a doomed place and, it's, you know, this is where people go to just, you know, get up and leave. And my experience, you know, working at CCRB, uh, sorry, in New York, you know, at an oversight agency there for 17 years, you know, it, it was full of chaos at all times. So, you know, to come here would be, in, in this situation, a bit like coming home. <laughs> um, I'd say that, you know, with, with a wink, but really, I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, the, 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 um, the panel, the monitor position, these are, these are new things. It's a new office, uh, and yeah, to, to have been around for a couple of years, that's still very new. And in government work, it's important you know, to communicate to the public that it's going to take time, and everyone needs to be patient. And there's, you know, what, when I hear about people quitting um, or looking for a new jobs shortly after arriving, these are growing pains. And I think until you find the right people and until you hit your stride, oh, it seems we've, okay. No. Sorry, it looked like there was a technical issue from our end. Um, <laughs> But I think until, until you, you really, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to get standard operating procedures in place, you have to get things, it takes a while to get all those things in place. And I think just constant communication with the public and the panel members that this is a difficult process. Some of you, you know, you're volunteering your time uh, after, in addition to doing a full-time job and you may not see the results you hope to see. So I think it's about expectation setting as well. When you uh, take a position on the panel, or if, or if a member of the community and you're paying attention, you may think that you know we have we, we wanted this, we asked for this, especially after what happened to Zaid Atkinson, and, and we've got it. But but the the change that I think people want it's it's going to take some time, and I think you know this is the nature of government. You have you know people that have you know like ideas people, and then you have policy people. And sometimes what's missing is the execution people. And I, for me, that's, that's where I wanna come in and do, is, is be an execution person. And I think you, you gain a lot of trust with the community. If you follow through with what you say you're gonna do, if you set expectations properly, 
And if you do what you say you're going to do and, you know, execute and, uh, you know, be transparent when, when you've hit a roadblock, when you've made a mistake, just admit it. And people can handle that and, and then move on. Um, I've worked through some very difficult circumstances over 17 years and I stuck with it. I left it and I'm trying to get back into this field because for me it's a calling. And so I want to be a part of it. You know, in, in applying for this job, it would mean uprooting my family. I have, I have two young teenagers. And so it's, it's not something that I take lightly. You know, if, if, if I end up in, in this position, which I would love, it would be a major move. And I'm, I've talked to my wife and we've, you know, we've taken all this into account, but I would be coming here, you know, for what I would plan to be the long haul. And I think also that would instill some sense of hope with people and help people feel a little bit better knowing that, that, that I have that amount of commitment. Thank you. Okay, how would you ensure that the concerns of historically excluded communities are heard and addressed? And Chris, we're gonna start with you on this one. <coughs> um, you know, Tanya, in her, in her last response, talked about community engagement, and it, and it is so important. And, you know, what does that look like? Uh, there's, there's all sorts of ways to engage the community. It's not just about, you know, posting on the government website or posting on Twitter. I think you have to go to where, you know, members of the community, especially those who um, are members of disenfranchised communities, those who are members of minority communities, those who are members of the um, disproportionately uh, arrested communities, um, and, and meet them where they're at, whether that's a community center, whether that's at a rec center, or um, you know, a playground, or a church, um, or a mosque, or you know, wh wherever it may be, and to, to spend time. I think that that's a big one, to spend time, uh, to show up in person, and to take a real interest, and uh, to be open, and, and to, to hear what, what they want to see, and like I said in my previous answer, uh, to execute. If, if, you, if you hear what they are uh, asking for and, and, and you're in a position to do something about it, again, not making false promises or, or raising expectations to a point where you can't follow through, but if there is something that can be done to follow through with them and to follow up, I think you know, following through is important, but also following up is, is, is very important at all levels of, of oversight from, you know, for people that file complaints and then just those, you know, who may have to in the future to um, make sure that they know that they have an outlet. So I think putting yourself out there uh, really boots on the ground, physical, like getting out, um, not just doing it digitally, but, but taking the time uh, to meet people. Excellent. Thank you. Let's go with Sherry for the next one. I don't have any disagreements with anything that Chris just said about being out in the public personally and meeting people where they are. When I've been thinking about how important community engagement is for this role, uh, I've been trying to think about ways to, ways to connect with communities, which will be challenging for all of us as outsiders. You know, we don't know the, the ins and outs of this community the way people in the stands and online do. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about was like how perfect it is that the police oversight panel has specific um, desires to have people from less represented communities on the panel. Um, those are hopefully ways to get introductions into, into communities um, to be able to meet people where they are um, and to, to be able to attend events and discussions that might not be obvious to an outsider otherwise. Um, besides the police oversight panel, because it seems like they do so much work, so I don't want to overburden them, um, but it seems like there are people, other people who would be helpful, who have a sense of community and an interest. Um, some of the, the members who were, were involved in Boulder's racial equity plan, um, some of the people who were involved in the um, engagement strategic framework, and certainly, you know, people who responded and were interested in the reimagining policing uh, plan. 
So those were some of the ways that I was thinking to be able to get out into the community, meet people where they are, um, and, and do it with an introduction. Don't just come in cold calling, basically, but having someone who's familiar with that community who hopefully can provide the introduction and you know, ex explain some of the lay of the land that none of us are going to know. Uh, uh, additionally, you know, several people have talked about this, you know, that's another opportunity to not just hear from people about what their concerns are, but also to start laying that groundwork for managing expectations, letting people understand, you know, the framework of the work that we do um, and what they can expect from it. Um, there are a lot of people, it sounds like Tanya's had this experience, uh, who, who don't have reasonable expectations about what we can do within the, the constrictions of police oversight. So explaining to people that there are Supreme Court rulings, that there are collective bargaining agreements, that there are state statutes, that officers are required to be given due process. That's something that I don't think comes out very often, but while engaging with the community and hearing their concerns, you can start laying that groundwork for um, expectations from the pro that they can have for the process. Thank you, Sherry. Tanya? I agree with everything that Chris and Sherry said. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I'll just say that I think that is really important in terms of helping to manage expectations. I think that, you know, on any given day, the police department is mad at me, and that's for part of the course, but also the community. And I think because people don't understand what our office does, they think when I don't do certain things, you know, why aren't you doing it and not understanding the constraints that we have. And so I think that would be really important. And I think also just managing my own expectations. Like, the truth is there's going to be some members of the community that are not going to want to meet with me until they see what I'm about, right? They're going to be like, oh, is she a part of the system? Is she a part of this? And so to me, this is a marathon and not a race, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that some people are not going to answer my phone call and some people are not going to want to hear from me until they see kind of what I'm made of. And so really making sure that I'm still making the entree, still talking about my willingness to meet and engage um, and hopefully get to all pockets of the community. As a black woman, um, this is this work is is really important to me because I, I think it's no shock um, when we turn on TV, et cetera, that a lot of people that are brutalized by the police tend to be African Americans and other people of color, um, and even when they're not people of color, you know, people that are, might be in economically disadvantaged situations. So for me, this is kind of really personal. It's just when I was doing work as a defense attorney, you know, on any given day, every time I was in court, all my clients looked very much like me. And so um, this whole notion around community engagement in, in those communities is extremely important. And so I believe in going out and then also going in, like maybe oppor having opportunities monthly or whatever, people to come and meet the monitor and, and do things as well as, you know, actually sometimes get out there and door knock, you know, partner with a voter registration group that's going door to door and hand them a pamphlet about oversight, right, and other things. And so um, just so people might not notice, but I'm also a pastor. So um, I don't know if anybody's had experience with the black church, but we know how to get out there and hit communities. So, <laughs> um, and so um, in that in that um, in that vein, I've had a lot of that. But um, just piggybacking what my um, colleague said, I think it's really going to be um, a lot of just people kind of just seeing it mm -hmm. and and knowing that there's an openness and a willingness to engage. Excellent. Thank you, Tanya. Okay. Next question: What specific steps? would you take to build trust between the Boulder Police Department, the police oversight panel, and community, specifically people from historically excluded communities? And Sherry, we'll start with you on this one. And I'm happy to repeat if that's helpful for folks. Uh, can you repeat it? Certainly. What specific steps would you take to build trust between the Boulder Police Department, the police oversight panel, and community specifically people from historically excluded communities? I, I think we probably answered, or at least provided the framework for um, community engagement is going to be a huge part of, of building that trust. Um, one of the things that I've thought about was the idea of trying to pull these different organizations you know, out of their silos and seeing on what projects we can work on together. Um, and specifically, what 
projects that are welcoming to the community and that the community can participate in. Um, some of the thoughts that I've had are ideas of having members of possibly the police oversight panel, Boulder Police, and the independent monitor position, you know, go out and you know, do a question and answer in a loose format, or maybe do some sort of specific training for what people can expect during a traffic encounter. The, the place where I think that could be really helpful is with our, um, our, the college aged population and the Boulder Valley High School students who maybe haven't had encounters with police yet, but you know, we know that that demographic, that, that age, has a lot of contact with police that can turn negative. So trying to meet people where they are so that they can you know, understand what to expect from policing and from police oversight and maybe be able to forestall some um, incidents that have you know, friction and conflict that don't need to be there. Um, regarding the historically disadvantaged communities who are going to have a much bigger gap of trust regarding the police department than maybe the general Boulder population, you know, community engagement is one step, but certainly, you know, doing the work. Like, this job is not just about community engagement. You know, it needs a strong investigative aspect. So people are going to want to see results. They're going to want to see that cases that are investigated are investigated thoroughly and that the recommendations and findings are appropriate for the situation. Obviously that involves managing expectations because people might have different expectations, but being able to then explain it um, after any incident or um, case review comes out, you know, that could be an opportunity to you know, not just have the, the results of the uh, investigation and the police oversight panel's thoughts on it and the independent monitor's comments on it, uh, and ultimately the police chief's decision, but you could go out and, and, and explain why different entities thought differently, what the evidence showed. Um, but building trust is not something that is going to be a, an easy fix. Um, policing is a very hot <coughs> topic you know, across America, and there's been a lot of, a, a lot of actions by police departments towards uh, minority communities that it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot from the police department and from the oversight entities in order to start building that trust. Thank you, Sherry. Tanya? So building on what Sherry was saying, I think that it's going to really be having these groups work together. Um, some of this is also just managing the expectations of that in a lot of these communities and these communities that have been historically targeted, there definitely is not going to be a lot of a lack of trust. And so um, I'll just give a quick example. So I think a lot of us watched Tyree Nichols be killed in Tennessee. And so my office put on a series of healing events where we involved the police. I took a lot of heat on that from the community were like how dare you involve the police they're the problem etc and also even when i called the police they were like i don't want to come there i know we're going to get beat up but what i did specifically was because in that case those of you that aren't familiar with it is that tyree nichols was killed and the majority of the officers were black so i in this case in dallas actually worked with the two black police associations and specifically invited them to be the people at the table talking about healing and how we wouldn't have something like this happen in the city of Dallas. And some community members didn't come. Straight up, they didn't come. We're like, we're not going to come to that, Tanya. But then over time, when they heard from members of the community that did come and participate, they now are like, I see where you're going with this. But there was a distrust with my office because they didn't understand why I would put community members in the room with police over such volatile issues. And so I think that's what I would hope to do here. I know that the Boulder Police Department is not as diverse as we would like, but there are pockets. And what you will often find, what I have found, is that the pockets in the police department mirror the world. 
And so the black officers, the women officers, the LGBT officers also within their own police department many times are experiencing the same thing that those communities are experiencing in the community. And so how do we bring that together? How do we work together um, to do those kind of things? And I think that, you know, that's just some of the, the work that's just going to have to be done. I know I said that from the, um, from the prior quest, um, question. But some of us really going to just be walking the walk and then hoping that people see the fruits of the labor that is being done. And are there other programs that we could do like mediation where people can actually sit across from the officer that they feel, you know, did something to them and talk it out, hear what they have to say, um, have the officer hear what the community member has to say. And so I think are there opportunities where we together as a community and the police department think about how to solve solutions so that we're not always kind of in silos. Thank you for that, Tanya. Chris. Wow. Uh, between everything that Tanya and <laughs> Sherry have said, it doesn't leave a lot of room for, for more ideas. They, they basically hit the, the nails on the head. Um, I, I will uh, maybe elaborate a little more on, on some thoughts that I have uh, about what they said. Um, Especially, you know, when, when Sherry spoke about results, I think that is so important. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I appreciate the person who, who asked that question using the term build trust. It's not an overnight thing. We can't just, you know, make trust. We can't just bestow trust. We need to build trust. And especially for when, when we're speaking about, you know, specifically historically excluded communities, that's a process and it's one that will take time. And so, yeah, building is really important to understand that it is gonna be a process and that, you know, to build, you have to start, you know, little by little, one foot after the other. And I have some ideas, you know, about engaging the community in order to help do that, you know, in, in order to build trust between the community, the police department, let's not, you know, we talk a lot about community engagement, but we also, you know, I think sometimes we just assume that means civilians, but the police department, they're also part of the community and we need to make sure that, you know, when we, we speak about engaging the community, we're engaging officers as well, or, you know, all ranks. Um, but at the end of the day, if, if the monitor and the, and the panel are not delivering results, it, it, all the community engagement that you do is, is not going to do anything toward establishing trust. So I think, you know, to echo some of what Sherry said and to, to really emphasize and, you know, underscore results based on rigorous investigations, you know, that where there's a, a very high bar to the investigations, uh, investigations that are uh, evidence-based, objective, conducted by a neutral person who's committed to that neutrality and evidence-based um, recommendations, uh, will go a long way, uh, especially if the police department uh, values and respects and acknowledges the, the high level of work that's being done. And, and, and so if that, if that can occur, then the police chief can follow through with the recommended discipline. And I think once you have concurrence there, you start to build trust when, when the community can see that the work that an independent investigator is doing, a monitor and the panel, and that it's being concurred with by the police chief, you can start that process. Uh, in terms of bringing groups together, some of the things that, that Tanya was talking about, you know, uh, I've seen it work in New York, and this would take, I, I don't want to just say this is something that any one of us could come in and make it happen overnight, but if you get buy-in from the police department, there are initiatives that, that you can start that will slowly, over time, build trust. I'm, and I'm thinking specifically, you know, in New York, there is the ride-along program where civilians can um, request to do a, a ride-along with, uh, you know, in, in a car, uh, a police car, and, and go on a tour, at least a partial tour, and get a sense of what it's like. What are these officers seeing every day, you know, day in and day out? What is their life like? What do they have to put up with? I think people don't have an idea of you know, just how hard that job is. You know, we, we only see the news headlines or the TV and it's so, it's so different. And that when, you know, I've been on a ride along and when I talk to people that have been on ride alongs, their mind is blown. They, 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 I had no idea that, you know, it was, it was like that. And some of them are like, I had no idea there's that much paperwork or, you know, on a slow day that they just sit there for so long, you know, that it's extremely, can be boring. Um, 
It's not usually the case in New York, but I'm sure that you know that happens as well. Uh, there are other things like the Citizens uh, Police Academy. This is something that NYPD runs, where they invite people to come, uh, and it is it is over the course of a couple of months, and it's at <coughs> night, and citizens can come and they can learn. You know, it's not the it's not a replica of the police academy, of course, but they can learn a lot of the the stuff that's being taught at the NYPD Academy, uh, especially in terms of um, the information, the knowledge that officers are given. And so they can, you know, people love to say when, when they're getting arrested, they know their rights. When they go to the police, the Citizens Police Academy, they actually do really learn their rights and procedures that the, the police are taught. That's uh, a great way for the public to become uh, knowledgeable. And then the last thing, and, and this is sort of a, a long-term dream for me, uh, for Boulder and for and for, I'd love to see it happen across the country. And that's, you know, this uh, I mentioned in my introduction. This uh, workshop that I participated in, it was with the Irondale Theater Company in Brooklyn, New York, and they have what is called to protect, serve, and understand TPSU, and it was started. The, the theater director started it after the death of Eric Garner. Um, and so for me, it was almost like full circle, having been part of that investigation and prosecution, then leaving the CCRB and then being invited to, be, to, to work on this in the 10th season. But, you know, I, I think I may have mentioned it in the introduction. You, you see seven civilians and seven officers come together. And for, for the program that I was in, it was every Tuesday night for 10 weeks. And it was from 6 to 10, so four hours together. And you had people who, who were fundamentally opposed, anti-cop. And they engaged with seven officers who, they didn't come in uniform, but they were on duty. They were being paid. They had the support of the NYPD. And over that course of 10 weeks, you know, you, you start with a meal. So you break bread together and you, you just talk to people as people. And it's, people aren't wearing, you know, name tags that identify civilian or officer. So for the first week or two, you weren't exactly sure who was a civilian and officer. And then over time, you know, so after you have this dinner and you break bread together, you get put through these um, theater exercises, improv exercises, and in a way that like breaks down people's guard. It, it, they, they sort of take off all their masks and shields and the theater directors are very good at this. Um, and so again, you know, by week four, five, six, People are way more open. And, and the theater director who started this, his idea was, you know, after seeing what happened to Eric Garner and how long it took for there to be any semblance of justice, it's not going to come from above. It's not going to come from politicians. It has to be done grassroots. And so his idea was, if we can just get them, you know, civilians and officers into a room and, and find a way to get them to walk a mile in the other's shoes, maybe we can start you know, a process of building trust. And I saw this happen firsthand. And in the end, you know, there's a, a two-night uh, two performance at, after 10 weeks. And, uh, you know, I think I was the only one from the civilian side that had never had any theater experience. And there I was, you know, singing, you know, hand in hand with officers and civilians. There was, a, there was like three different songs. And as anyone that knows me would tell you, I'm not a singer. Um, I, can, I cannot carry a tune, but I was there. And it just... Everyone there just came to see each other in a different light. And I think, you know, I would love to see a program like that happen in Boulder, and I would love to see it happen in all sorts of different towns, you know, towns across the country. But there are ways, and, and I think when you, when, you, when you point in that direction and you, ha you can affect one person, that one person may change the mind of someone else. Maybe there's a pastor in the group, and their mind has changed about how they think of police-civilian interactions, and they go to their church, and then... You know, it carries, it carries on. And so, yeah, I think there are, are things you can do. It doesn't have to be exactly like that. But um, to, to circle back to where I started, and I'm sorry for going on so long here, but uh, if you don't have the results and if you're not doing good investigations, all of that is for naught. Okay. Thank you for that. We're going to pivot and start taking some of the questions from our live studio audience. Um, but, yes, a reminder to please do try and keep your... Um, answer is a little bit more brief. We're aiming for about three minutes each, but thank you for the wonderful story. Okay, next question. There are fundamental structural constraints in conducting the work of the police oversight panel. For example, the police union. In your experience, 
What are ways to effectively work with these constraints? And Tanya, I'm going to start with you on this one. So this is really, um, that's going to be a tough question to answer. So in both the jurisdictions where I work, New Orleans and also Dallas, so New Orleans has unions and Dallas has associations. They are very strong. Um, and in my experience, um, in both instances, they didn't want oversight. And so they made it very hard because um, I know for a fact that a lot of times they would encourage officers not to work with my office, uh, not to be cooperative, et cetera. And so in that way, um, I did use an approach that I, I would agree with Chris, I wouldn't always use, but I did have to kind of work from the top down. So a lot of times I would work with command staff, the police chief and their staff to actually put policies into place. That way we would assure that things were at least on paper that needed to happen. Now, of course, the caveat to that is that there's a lot of stuff on paper that still don't happen on the street, right? When somebody's getting pulled over in the traffic stop or when I'm calling to ask you a question about what happened and you, you know, act like you don't know who I am, et cetera. So um, that's a very, very tough one. But that has been one of the ways is to make sure that things start being embedded um, into policy, into uh, the way that the department works with my office. I think that it's always great to have a memorandum of understanding between the police department and the oversight panel and office. Uh, this is how we're going to work. These are how the things you're going to have access to. This is what's going to happen. Um, and so that there is a baseline. But that is a very, very tough question. So I'm curious because my you know, Dallas has a big police department, but you're looking at, you know, the number one, and I think Chicago is like, what, number three or four or something to that. So I'm curious about how they've managed to do all of that, but that's, that's extremely tough. Okay. Thank you for that. Chris? I still have some time left in my responses. <laughs> you do. <laughs> we'll allow it. <laughs> three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, I would, I would, I would like to hear of the of a, of a police union that uh, wants oversight of their officers. Um, I, I, it certainly is is not the PBA in New York, um, or the SBA or the DA, DEA. Uh, you know, yeah, it is a very real and a very difficult um, uh, challenge to navigate. And I think you know we, we've we've talked about this all three of us, but you know. Um, establishing trust and expectations, I think a lot of it goes toward you, you have to show that, you know, what kind of work you're going to be doing. And I think, you know, it, it may be very hard uh, to, to go up against unions or to, to get their buy-in that, that you can be trusted, that you can be trusted to do a, a fair job. You know, they're never going to want oversight, but if they see that you're fair, um, you can make some inroads. And that's what I found in working, you know, at the CCRB, when, as an investigator working with specific union rep, reps, when they would be present during a, an officer interview, you know, they're always going to challenge you, at least this is in, in my experience, they'd always challenge new investigators uh, a lot in their first number of, of interviews because they wanted to see what that investigator was made of and, if, you know, how they would respond, could they get under their skin. Over time, you can, if you establish yourself as a, as a fair interviewer, as someone that's not going to be trying to do something tricky, uh, you're there to do a job and to hear the officer out and give them every opportunity to answer, um, not try to spring something on them to catch them, you know, in a, in a compromised situation when there's no need. I think that, you know, once you establish that reputation, you can start to make inroads where you, it, it's not going to... Um, it's not going to negate that challenge, but it, it's going to, I think, decrease um, the, the level of challenge that, that you have to contend with. Okay. Thank you. Sherry? Uh, Chicago is no better. Um, <laughs> just in case you were hoping to hear that the Fraternal Order of Police welcomed us with open arms, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint. Um, we. The, the union issue and the collective bargaining agreements that, that officers have, you know, it is. It, I'm great that I'm, I'm so pleased that someone in, in the audience, though, understands this issue because these are real constraints. And, you know, memorandums of understanding are great, um, but they, officers have codified rights 
and we have to afford them the due process that is in that are in their agreements. Um, one of the one of the realities of it is, you know, if we want those the their their uh, due process to change, if we want to give police oversight, you know, more access, um, that has to be done, you know, at the bargaining table, and that's something where people out here and members of the community and um, can can talk to the city government and say this is something important. And it's certainly not easy because it's, um, it's very challenging, my understanding is, at bargaining tables to uh, reduce rights that have previously been codified. Um, but there, it, it is just simply a fact that it has to be worked with. Um, I've definitely developed, when I was still doing interviews, the same sort of rapport with some of the um, police uh, union attorneys, um, but the fact of the matter is they might be agreeable and you can you know, make some headway into on, on small issues, but if it's a serious issue where there is you know, high levels of dis discipline or termination on the line, n nothing that you've pre n no goodwill that you've previously developed is going to yeah. stop them from being you know, pit bulls in defense of their clients. Um, so I, I just acknowledge that it is a structural constraint that police oversight has to work within. And if it's going to be changed, it's going to be changed um, either legislatively or at the bargaining table. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. Okay. This one's got tiny writing. <laughs> As monitor, you would decide what details of police misconduct allegations are communicated to the panel and eventually to the general public. What guides your standards of transparency and what information do you believe can or should be given or withheld to the public? Let's start with Chris. Okay, well I think that for the first part of that question, what details should be given to the panel, I think, you know, every detail possible. I, I don't see any reason to withhold details of an investigation from panel members to the extent that, you know, it's, it's allowed by the ordinance and, uh, you know, the rules. But um, I, I can't, you know, other than that, I, I don't, I cannot um, imagine why I, as monitor, would want to withhold any, any evidence or details from panel members who are going to be making recommendations on discipline um, or, uh, you know, evaluating the, the investigation. Um, in terms of the public, you know, I, I'm in favor of transparency um, to, you know, as, as much transparency as possible. And I think we need to be careful. Uh, I think that's a but. But we need to be careful <laughs> when we talk about transparency. Because, you know, there, there are certain things that, you know, for the for the good of the investigation that you cannot disclose to the public, even if the investigation is over. Uh, there are details um, that you cannot disclose to the public because you don't want to violate you know, uh, an officer's um, privacy or a civilian's privacy, or there may be, um, <coughs> there may be other, other concerns within an investigation. You know, I can't think of all the, all the things now, but I, I would say that I'm in favor of transparency up until the point that you, know, you, you communicate everything that you're, you can uh, that's permissible. Um, but I think the public also needs to understand that that doesn't mean we can just turn over an entire case file to them. Like there are certain things that need to be kept confidential. Um, and I think that, you know, that goes for the, for the monitor's office uh, and for the police department. I, I would always encourage, you know, the police departments to be more transparent. It, it usually serves them and, and helps them uh, when they're more transparent. Uh, and lastly, I would say, you know, it, it is important also to recognize that some of these things may be outside of the monitor's control. You know, the, the monitor is uh, working um, under the city manager. And so I think one of the first things I would want to be clear with um, the public is, you know, what, what are the rules uh, in terms of transparency? But I would also want to be clear with the city manager and know you know, what, what are the, the procedures in terms of issuing statements? Does that go through the press office? You know, I, I would never want to 
um, send out mixed messages or interrupt a timeline or, or go counter narrative to what the city was was planning on announcing, you know, in a different um, platform. Okay, thank you. How about you, Sherry? Uh, you can leave your microphones on. <laughs> okay. Uh, I absolutely agree that um, unless there are constraints on what information can be shared with the panel, it seems completely appropriate that the panel members, because they're con when they choose to conduct their own review of an investigation, that they should be privy to all of the, the details. Um, I, I don't know if there's any constraints on information that currently can be shared from the monitor to the police oversight panel, but I would think that anyone charged with investigating or reviewing an investigation for thoroughness and to make recommendations would need to have all of the details in order to make an accurate assessment of the situation. Um, regarding information to the public, that that poses some additional challenges because you definitely want to be in a situation where you are maintaining the integrity of the investigation, <coughs> but that balances out with transparency. And I was speaking earlier with, uh, during the reception how my views on transparency have effectively done a 180. Um, I previously would have said that I weighed the integrity of the investigation more than the public's need to know. And that is completely not true anymore. I have seen in Chicago, since we've changed our policies, how much more effective it is to build trust by providing the public with as much information about our investigations as we can at different points in time. So we have a, an entire transparency team that goes through um, and redacts video uh, to maintain people's privacy and, and releases the relevant reports and audio that we have, and that's frankly been wonderful for oversight in Chicago and the public's trust of us. And then on the back end, we also release our reports with you know, just redactions for, again, privacy reasons of the um, involved parties. Uh, that is something that I think is really effective for the organization so that people who are interested in diving deeper into an individual case or police oversight in, in general have the ability to access that. So I would say as much as feasibly allowed is the amount of access that I would want to give to the public. Thank you. Tanya? I agree with what uh, Chris and Sherry said in terms of the access of the panel. To me, the panel has to have everything. And so even in Dallas, when our board um, does the work, I package the whole entire file up for them and they get to see the whole file as they have to deliberate and think about the cases. So I think that's kind of a no-brainer that the panel should have it. In terms of the um, public, I'm going to pretty much agree with a, like, a lot of what my colleague said. Um, one of the things that I did, my very first big policy change in Dallas was to have a video release policy. So until June of 2020, Dallas did not have a video release policy. So they just released it when they felt like releasing it. And so I worked with the chief at the time. We co-wrote the video policy. And so now the Dallas Police Department, within 72 hours of an officer-involved shooting or death in custody or critical incident, has to release it unless they explain why they're not going to release it. Um, and even then, it can't be withheld forever, but they have to at least talk to my office and explain why. I also then went and made that policy retroactive because there were so many families whose loved ones had been killed by the Dallas Police Department that had never seen the video release policy, so I made that policy retroactive for any family members of people that had been killed um, by the Dallas Police Department to be able to go back if it existed and see video footage. So for me, um, transparency is very, very important. We also do the same thing. We make our investigations public. So the board package, where our board meets every month, uh, gets posted on our city secretary's site, which is open to the public. And so all of our investigations are there. Um, people can see our investigations. Um, and so they know what went into it. They know the facts. They know everything. They know what our recommendations are, et cetera. And so for me, it's really uh, very, very important that the public be able to see. And then also, we make it accessible. So along with the maybe report that might be 30 pages, we also do like a two-pager. 
that kind of just sums up who the officers were, who the you know um, complainants were, this, that, and the other, and make it very accessible about what was the violation, what were the recommendations, so that people that may not have time to read a 25, 30 page investigation report can see it in like a page or two and know what's going on and know what's happening uh, in their department. So transparency is very, very important for me in terms of both the panel and um, the community. The community. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. All right, how would you ensure that the Boulder Police Department is held accountable for any misconduct or excessive use of force against all community members and specifically historically excluded community members? And Sherry, I'm gonna ask to start with you on this one. You want me to repeat it? How would you ensure that the Boulder Police Department is held accountable for any misconduct or excessive use of force against all community members, and specifically historically excluded community members. So that's effectively the entire purpose of the independent monitor position and the police oversight panel. Um, complaints that are received you know, need to be first investigated by the the professional standards unit and then it is the the duty of the independent monitor to review and work with the um, professional standards unit to ensure that as the investigation proceeds that it is thorough that it is fair that it is at it, it follows investigative standards that's the whole purpose of this um, you know obviously then the the independent monitor you know, makes recommendations on whether the misconduct occurred and then, or makes findings on whether the misconduct occurred and then recommendations on discipline. Um, the police oversight panel is charged with the same, same task. This is a serious responsibility for you know, anyone who sits in the independent monitor's position. Um, but it needs to be based in evidence where the evidence goes, reviewing everything as possible, obtaining information in a timely manner, and making sure that any member who, any member of the public who feels like they've been mistreated and complains about the police department is comfortable making a complaint, is comfortable proceeding with the process. Um, we often have to talk people into giving statements because it's hard to, talk about incidents where you feel like you've been mistreated, especially if it's because of something like your race or some sort of protected class. So I would think that if there is someone who's reluctant to cooperate with an investigation, you know, reaching out to them, trying to assure them of the fairness of the investigation, of the need for them to, to cooperate, not just for their own sake, but so that if there is misconduct that's occurring, that we can try to prevent it and you know, keep it from happening again to another person. Um, I know that there are issues about you know, holding the police accountable since the chief of police has ultimate responsibility and decision-making power under the ordinance currently to determine what discipline is appropriate for the police officer or officers who were involved in an incident. And that's something that certainly my understanding is is a possibility to change in the ordinance. And if the community feels like that power should not be in the hands of the police chief, then the expectation is that since this is still a you know new malleable system, that that ultimate responsibility for accountability could be held um, in the hands of someone other than the chief, depending on how the ordinance is re rewritten in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Tanya? So I think that's an interesting question in terms of accountability. And what I would say is that I think we have to look at accountability in various ways. So um, going back to the former question about transparency, I do feel that because, as Sherry said, the police chief has kind of the ultimate final say on discipline, et cetera, Part of it is to be reporting out to the public actually what happened. 
To me, that's part of transparency. That's part of accountability. So when a recommendation is made for officer so-and-so to get some training or to get suspended or whatever, and it happens or doesn't happen, you all need to know that. Um, and I think it's really important. So today, if you Google the Dallas Morning News, there's a big story on the front page of the paper about an officer who has had serious disciplinary issues for over 10 years and ultimately ended up killing somebody. And so those are the kind of things that I talk to police chiefs about. I was like, if you don't want to work with the board now, you don't want to work with the panel now, you don't want to address these issues, we're going to be documenting them. And to me, that's a part of accountability because if you have officers that are problematic, you need to address those before it gets to the point where someone's life is being taken or somebody's seriously uh, injured. And so for me, part of that, and I don't know if there's an annual report or, or how we would do it, I'd work with the panel to figure that out, but we need to be reporting out to you what our recommendations are and getting formal responses from the police, like are you going to adopt them, are you not, why are you not? Et cetera, even if they're not required to do it, I think it's incumbent upon us to make the ask and to document so that as we start to track patterns. I mean, one of the good things, uh, one of the things that a monitor does is risk assessment for a city. That's one of the things I should be doing is saying to you, as interesting, Officer Smith has now, this is his fifth complaint or her third complaint, and this thing seemed very similar. Maybe we should be talking to the police chief about this or whatever. And so to talk about our risk, how are we managing our risk? Do we really want to open up the bowl of paper and see that the departments have been on notice about a particular officer at any given time and things haven't happened? And so... Um, those are some of the ways that I think we, we also look at accountability. So even if the discipline doesn't happen in a particular case, how are we documenting it? How are we um, making sure that we're keeping track of potential uh, problem officers um, that we need to be working with the police chief uh, and her team um, around addressing? And I also just want to say that some of that also could be training. Right? They're human beings like us. They could have been going through a divorce. Maybe somebody's child is sick. You know, that doesn't mean that an officer has to be frozen in time for a particular issue of misconduct. But we do need to look behind it and see what's going on. Thank you, Tanya. How about you, Chris? Well, I, I mean, between Sherry and, and Tanya, I'd just like to say ditto and ditto. Uh, I really agree strongly with what you both said. And, you know, I do think that Tanya's right. There's different types of accountability. And, you know, in terms of the police uh, chief having the final decision on discipline, um, that's something that currently, as it stands, as, as Sherry, you know, very eloquently stated, um, the, the monitor doesn't have control over, but could possibly potentially have control over. But even if the monitor doesn't, that doesn't mean the officers aren't being held accountable in some form or fashion. The fact that there was an investigation, that there is a record of it, uh, to, to me that, that means even though the discipline may not be what the citizen, uh, the victim of, of the misconduct wanted or what the monitor thought was just, uh, that officer is being held accountable to a certain extent. And the key to accountability is knowing when there is misconduct, or at least being made aware of allegations of misconduct. And I think that that's, that's really one of the biggest areas that needs work, and that's not just in Boulder, but everywhere, and especially when you're speaking about historically uh, excluded groups or marginalized communities where a lot of the misconduct occurs. Uh, these are groups that, you know, it, it's, they don't trust government uh, they don't trust government services. They don't trust the police. And they have no reason to trust a monitor, an independent monitor. And so I think, you know, this comes back to, and I won't repeat, you know, what, what we've gone, at, you know, on at length about in terms of outreach, but I think you really need a robust outreach plan in order to get people to understand not just that they have a place to make a complaint, but that their complaint, you know, something will happen with it that it'll be taken seriously, they will be heard, there will be a record of it. And again, that goes back to something I discussed earlier, following through and following up, making sure that they know what happened. Thank you. Okay. Another, tiny, another tiny printer. Some community members are intimidated or do not trust the police oversight panel or its process because of their status. Language barriers, 
fear of retaliation, etc. How would you change that situation and how would you ensure their safety? We'll start with Tanya on that one. Uh, that's the interesting. The last part of that question is really interesting. I had that same part about ensuring safety um, in a form that I did a few months ago. And I have to just say to the community, and this is very unfortunate, I can't ensure your safety. Um, the reality of it is none of, I won't be there, probably neither members of the panel when you're probably having that encounter with the police. And I cannot say that a member of the police department will not retaliate against you. I mean, those are the things that if people are inclined to be those people, that's going to be who they are. But what I can say is that I will ensure that we know that the issues are happening. I mean, one of the things that's, that's uh, I think is um, a problem in Dallas is that we don't have anonymous complaints. In order for an officer to be disciplined, the complaint has to be signed. And I have been pushing really hard to change that, but it's like Sherry said, changing these things is like pulling teeth when it comes to unions, associations. And so I still am, don't sleep at night sometimes because I know there's stuff in Dallas that I don't know about because people don't even want to come. They may want to come and talk to me personally or a member of my team, but they don't want to put it on a piece of paper because there is fear. Um, that there'll be retribution, especially in communities like undocumented communities. Like I do a lot of work with undocumented communities to try to figure out the best ways to keep them safe, um, to hear what's going on. And so some of it's depending on who the community is, and we're talking about historically excluded communities, is going to be trying to think of those creative ways to do it. But I, I will never, I cannot guarantee um, safety, but I can guarantee that we will figure out the best ways to document patterns, to document issues. Um, and also, I understand that situation. And our, and our uh, board is appointed by the city council and the mayor. And so there's probably definitely a lot of that feeling, too. Some people feel that the board members are kind of removed um, from the communities, et cetera. But I think that a lot of that is going to go back to community engagement. I work with my board members all the time. I encourage them, like, hey, you have to be out in the community. You know, you have to do this. And I, I know a lot of them have full-time jobs, so I will do the flyers for you. I will staff the tables for you. I will do whatever to make it easy for them just to go out and hear. And so we do a lot of town halls, a lot of what is going on, our, community, our board members, um, et cetera. So I think a lot of it's going to be community engagement and really in the vulnerable communities, the marginalized communities, really figuring out very creative ways to make sure that the issues that they that are impacting their communities um, can, even if it's not in the form of a formal complaint with somebody's name on it, I think the, the purview of this office and this panel can still lift up those issues in ways that help keep people safe um, or safer. Um, and still allow the police department to have to um, engage those issues. Thank you, Tanya. Chris? I think that this comes, this is the other side of, of transparency that we've talked about so much, uh, being transparent and, and letting people know that you can't guarantee their safety. Uh, that's, that is the reality of the situation. Um, it's, it, you know, I, I wish I could, I wish any of us could, um, but, you know, for, for, for someone to say, you know, make a complaint, you'll be okay, there, there won't be retaliation, or the officer won't arrest you for something else um, next time, to, that's, that's being disingenuous, and it could be dangerous uh, for, for that person, to, for them to believe that. Um, in New York, you know, one of the things when, when people were, would voice concern, uh, fear over retaliation, you know, the first thing is to, to recognize, yes, that is, you know, we understand you have that fear. It's a common fear. Um, and then we would let them know, you know, the statistics on allegations of retaliation. And they were infinitesimal. I mean, there's almost hardly any cases where someone would come back after uh, having participated in a CCRB investigation where they were retaliated against. But if, if in fact they were, um, then that allegation is in almost all cases worse than, than the first uh, allegation of misconduct that the officer committed or allegedly committed. Um, so for the, you know, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. That's not to say it can't happen. I think that um, 
it'd be really important to you know have a message to message to people especially those when we talk about status you know if people that have immigration um, that, 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 that don't have immigration status in, that may come from a country where they can't imagine there being any kind of accountability for law enforcement. And here, you know, they are, and they're being told not only is there accountability, but even as someone that doesn't have um, immigration status, they can make a complaint and there, there can be, that officer can be held accountable. I, I think that part of that message needs to be, you know, we can't guarantee that nothing, you know, that there won't be retaliation or that you'll, you know, that we can't guarantee your safety. But, you know, what we can almost guarantee is that if you don't make a complaint or if you don't participate in the process, then the officer who's committing that misconduct won't be held accountable. And that officer may in turn be encouraged to continue that behavior and you may continue to be a victim of that behavior. And so I think it's just a kind of flipping it around and, and letting people know that, that you know, while we can't guarantee their safety, we, we can almost guarantee that by not participating, not making complaints, um, we, we can't do anything to hold those officers accountable. I don't actually know that I have much to add to what you said specifically about how to message this. Um, my experience at COPA is very surprising from what I expected going in that allegations of retaliation are, are incredibly low. And that was not what I expected when I started the job. I thought that that would be a serious concern and that we would see repeat um, or re repeated situations where people filed a complaint and then felt like they were retaliated against. So I think sharing that with people it could be helpful, but if they feel fear, that fear is real to them, um, especially if it's something involving you know safety or concerns about what if their immigration status was was threatened, um, how that would impact their life and their family. So certainly trying to message that, but it seems like this is something where we probably would want to, you know, use some data to also get an understanding of what the scope of this problem might be. You know, try to identify the percentage of complaints that come from um, vulnerable populations versus their, you know, interactions and contacts with police. Um, so if that seems like something that we could really identify a big gap between people who are feeling safe coming to the independent monitor and filing a complaint and people who are just completely outside of that system. And it could be an issue of knowledge and it could be an issue of fear, but until you un understand it better and then go out into the communities and try to, figure, try to talk to people directly to hear what their concerns are, um, it's a, it's a hard situation to speculate about. Um, another area might be to you know, reach out to public defenders because you know, we have complaints that are filed, but it w you know, we wonder like, you, you don't know what you don't know. Like, what are the complaints that we're not getting? What are the complaints that we never hear about? We never are afforded the opportunity to be investigated um, because either people lack knowledge or they don't trust the situation in terms of the ability and effectiveness of oversight in Boulder to bring justice to their, to their incident. So I think reaching out to um, public defenders might help understand and capture some cases that we previously wouldn't have known about. Um, certainly they don't, almost every de public defender I've dealt with uh, does not allow their client to speak with, uh, <laughs> with um, oversight and provide a statement um, while their criminal charges are pending, but maybe encourage them to you know, reach out you know, once, a char once a, the criminal disposition is settled you know, to come to the independent monitor. And maybe it's a few months after the incident occurred, but we can still investigate that. Um, but you know, as everyone said regarding this question, it's an unfortunate situation where you know, we cannot guarantee and be honest anyone's safety or that you know, these files can't be subpoenaed by, um, by someone else like the state's attorney or um, in other lawsuits. Thank you. 
All right. Acknowledging your own identity and social location, what are your thoughts on the barriers that folks from historically marginalized communities face when a accessing what police oversight can offer? And Chris, I'm going to ask you to start this one off, please. Thank you. And I'm going to ask that you repeat the question. I want to make sure that I yep, get totally. everything in there. Acknowledging your own identity and social location, what are your thoughts on the barriers that folks from historically marginalized communities face when accessing what police oversight can offer? Yeah, I think that for me, as a, a white male, um, I think that it's important that I, that I acknowledge that I, I, while I can appreciate and understand and, and through the work that I've done and the, and the people I've worked with come to some sort of understanding um, about what historically marginalized communities uh, go through, it's important for them to know. I, I don't know. I, I can't speak from, from a, a, a knowledge of, like, I know what that's like. I can't say to someone, I know what you're feeling. Um, I imagine that it's difficult. I imagine that those barriers are very real and can be very scary and can be prohibitive in coming forward uh, and participating in the process. Um, and, and I've been fortunate enough to, to, to work with people that are um, from some of those historically marginalized communities and through you know, colleagues at work and through friendships I've gotten some really good insight, um, you know, and, and from, from my own wife, uh, who, is, who came to this country uh, as an undocumented immigrant. And her mom brought her here uh, from Peru, and they went, you know, they, they left Peru when she was 10. She went to Mexico, and uh, eventually they got to Virginia, and, you know, she was naturalized um, when I met her. But, you know, I, I don't, even hearing, you know, stories from her, I can't pretend that I know what that's like, even from someone as close, you know, having spent time with my wife. And, and, I, can, and I can see how that, um, how that affects people, you know, when there was um, a, a lot happening <coughs> at, at the border uh, just recently, um, a, a couple months ago, and there was a wave of immigration, and there was some really nasty things being said. And I could see how that, that affected my wife. Um, because she sees herself in those people, and it's not, it's not just happening to others. When she sees this on the news and, and when she hears people making insensitive comments, they're saying it to her, like she literally feels that. And it's the same way that my colleague who had the same position as I did uh, just um, during, the, during the Black Lives Matters protests, uh, she's a black female, she's a Jamaican immigrant, and she helped me to understand that it's not you know, when she's watching the news and she's seen what's happened to George Floyd and what she's seen happen to people who are protesting, it, it wasn't just, she wasn't just watching someone else. It's happening, it was happening to her the way she experienced it and it was traumatic for her. So that helped me to, to understand that. Um, but, but I can't, I can't know. I can, I can only, you know, try to imagine and try to exude as much empathy as, as possible. Thank you. Sherry? Um, the issue is really challenging. And certainly it's, you know, we see a lot of information from people who, you know, have this distrust, um, you know, of government structures and that, that they don't think, you know, they're not going to do nothing. Why waste your time? And you know, I've heard that many times. I've you know, been able to convince a lot of people to be able to come in, provide a statement, and, and trust the process. Um, but I grew up in a really rural, small town community in dairy farming, Wisconsin, where you know, frankly, the police pulled me over almost every night when I was driving home from my friend's house at 2 o'clock in the morning. But it was annoying. I didn't fear them. It was just something that was going to take an extra 10 minutes before I got home. So that's my relationship um, growing up, where police were not something to fear. And certainly that is not the situation for you know, many communities. Um, 
you know, African American communities who have been over policed and under resourced. And then as you talk about, you know, immigrant communities or people who come from cultures where police are abusive. That's what they do. They do not help you. They hurt you. They take from you. They threaten you. So I I, I totally recognize that those are real barriers. And I know we talked about this so much earlier on, but this is where developing those relationships through community engagement is going to be important to hopefully have people who might be able to you know, talk to someone who otherwise is too distrustful or, or too afraid or you know, previously would have lacked knowledge. Um, there's an incident in my past that I, you know, I've told some people about and they said, you know, did you file a complaint? I had no idea. I was just in Chicago for two years. And I had no idea, you know, as a law student that there was any sort of police accountability structure in Chicago or any complaint that could be filed whatsoever. And I'm sure even had I known, I would have thought nothing's going to happen from this incident. So I definitely can empathize with people who don't think that it's worth their time and that nothing good is going to come from it. Um, but I think the one of the answers is, you know, just keep working and reaching out to those communities to, you know, develop relationships that can be leaned on um, to try to reach people who have no trust or very low trust in the system. Thank you. Tanya? So I think, you know, with my identity, it's pretty complicated. So even though I'm African-American woman, dark skin, so there's never any question about who I am, um, I had to realize some of my own limitations in terms of my own privilege. So um, being someone is educated, being someone that's a lawyer, someone that grew up middle class. And I think that when I first started this journey, um, you know, when I was a baby um, in law school and, and clerked at the public defender's office and I would have my, I call them my baby clients or my juvenile clients and, you know, they might have been 16 and accused of an armed robbery and I would say naive stuff like, well, how are you out of the house at 3 a.m. to be accused of an armed robbery, right? Like, and these are black clients that look just like me, right? Because that wasn't my experience. Like, for me to be out of my house at 3 a.m. doing anything, my parents would have probably done whatever. And so... I think, and so fast forward 25 years from then, it has really helped me understand that even as a black woman, I don't walk in a lot of the shoes that the people that are coming to my office to file complaints are walking in. But I walk in enough of the shoes because when people don't know that, when they don't know it's Tanya McClary Esquire or whatever, I, all the times where when I was a public defender, if I wasn't wearing a suit, they thought I was the client. There were times when I was wearing the suit and might have been standing beside somebody white and they talked right to the white person, didn't even address me, et cetera. So I've had enough of those experiences in my own life to understand. And it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, the experience that Chris was saying about his colleague, when I watch these videos of George Floyd, I just relive it. It's almost traumatic and it just brings up a lot of historical trauma. Um, for people in my community. And so it's so important for me to be able to help figure out ways that I can help people bring their truth to power. So for example, um, in the city of Dallas, you know, when I first started the complaint process, you went online, it was some PDF or whatever. People can't fill out a PDF. So one of the first things I did was, how do we make it easy? So now if you come to our website and click a button, you can fill out your complaint form on, on a smartphone. You don't even have to have a computer. Other things was I went to the library and said, can we put our, we did a brochure, how to file a complaint. Can we put them in every library? And can we put complaint forms there? So if people don't have a computer, because you know a lot of times people come to the library to use a computer. So we have forms there. We train the librarians if somebody has questions. And also working with like the Parks and Recs Department to make sure that complaints and issues about that. So places that community members would go, potentially members that might have these encounters, are um, accessible. And so um, if you hire me as the police monitor, you have someone that um, understands different issues around privilege, but also really understands what it's like to walk in certain skins. And even then, if I don't understand it fully, um, with enough of my lived experience and, and hearing the lived experience from other community members, um, can really fully understand it, I think, in a way um, that's really important. 
Um, it also helps build trust. Uh, most people, when they come to my office, you know, especially people from the immigrant community, um, the LGBTQ plus community, even though those may not be my identities, get enough sense of me of like, okay, she's got us. We might have to school her a little bit. We might have to educate on what our issues are and how they're different than maybe the black community or the, you know, other communities. But we think that she gets us enough that she'll at least be helpful in us trying to figure out um, our next steps. Thank you for that. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So I need a coin. <laughs> All right, we'll go with this one. We'll go with this one. <laughs> Sorry, people. In this work, we hear often that the community really need to empathize more with the police. How do you change the minds of a police force to better empathize with community, especially historically marginalized peoples? And we'll go ahead and start with Chris on this one. It's the difference between one and two questions, Chris. I'm just telling you on the time. <laughs> I believe at the beginning of this, we were um, instructed to speak very slowly. <laughs> Fair. So I'm going to try to follow directions. Okay. Um, I, I recently saw a, a documentary, I think it was on HBO or Max, whatever they're calling it now, called Ernie and Joe. And it is about two officers um, who spend a lot of time going out into the community and res to respond to people in uh, mental health crisis. And it, and it showed the difference between when you take that role and um, you know, just sort of give yourself over to it even if it takes the whole day to, to deal with people who are having a mental health crisis, uh, the, the difference you can make um, versus, you know, sort of the way that a lot of these incidents are dealt with where officers will come in and, and just quickly handcuff the person and remove them from the situation. And some of you may have seen it. If you haven't, I'd, I'd really encourage anyone to try to get a hold of it, whether on HBO or at the library. It's, it's really eye-opening to see that there, a difference can be made uh, when the effort is put to it. And one of the points they made was that at, I think on average, officers receive like 60 hours of training in how to use a firearm, but only eight hours in how to deal with someone in mental health crisis when they're at academy. And uh, in their precinct, they changed that so that people, so that, uh, in the academy, officers were required, recruits were required to, you know, do the 60 or whatever hours, but they had to have 40 hours of training in how to deal with mental health crises. And these officers then started to, you know, take this outside of their, their home community uh, and um, spread, spread this around. And it was, it was through this training and, and putting on workshops, other officers were able to to learn this, to see the difference. And so I think that, you know, when we talk about getting officers to be more empathetic, it's not a matter of, you know, just telling officers, be more empathetic. <laughs> it, they have to be shown. And I think probably the best way is for them to be shown by other officers. And so it's about empowering those who are in positions of authority or those who are the decision makers and working with our counterparts in the police department and you know, for, for any one of us who is going to be the monitor, I think it would, it would behoove uh, the community, the officers, everyone for us to partner and collaborate with people in the police department to uh, identify who are the right officers to lead trainings like that. It's not just about dealing with mental health crisis, but tr to lead trainings in how to be more empathetic. And there are creative ways to do that. It is possible, but I don't know necessarily that someone from the outside is the best person to do it. But it's about you know, figuring out who is within the department 
and hopefully get in, you know, convincing our, I think, you know, our job, the, the monitor's job would be to convince them that this is something worth doing. Okay. Thank you. Tanya? I think what was said was, was spot on. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, because I think we underestimate um, what goes on uh, in police departments. I alluded to that earlier in one of my answers. Like, I'll just give you a sense of it. So in Dallas, I say we don't have unions. We have association, but there's two black police associations. There's a Hispanic police association. There's a Asian his, uh, uh, police association. And just recently, now there's a women's association. So those associations formed, right, by officers because they felt like there, there were issues that they were not being addressed, right? So a lot of times you just have one police association, right, or one police union, but the fact that we have one for almost every um, group is very interesting and telling to me. And so I do feel like there are ways that uh, we could work with um, police officers to help inform each other. You know, one of the trainings that um, is going on in police departments now is able where they're actually encouraging officers to be active you know don't be active bystanders to engage right I think if we all look back at George Floyd I think we're just as appalled as all the officers that were standing around as we are with George Chauvin who actually had his you know knee on the neck of George Floyd I mean when I go back and watch that video and I'm just like what is happening here why is no one are intervening and so I think to empower our officers to be able to say that with each other. But I think also programs that officers have to come and hear from community members. You know, Chris talked about this program that seems phenomenal to me, and I, I was an uh, undergrad and did a lot of theater, so this is like, like oh, this is exciting. Um, but we also have something in Dallas that I would hope to bring here. We do a series called Together We Dine. And what that is, is that they bring in community members and police officers, and over a meal, they discuss really tough questions about community, about policing, in a setting where the officers are not in uniform, they're in red clothes, they're right there with the community, and they are talking about tough issues, but over a meal, right? I know food is an entree for many of us, right? We, you, you know, people, a lot of wonderful things happen over food, and so, um, even, you know, maybe replicating something like that here in Bold Aware, because I think it's important for officers to actually hear from community members um, and also for community members to, um, to hear from them. So I think getting, this, getting them in a room, but then also figuring out how we can work with officers themselves would be important. Thank you, Tanya. Okay, Sherry. I love both of your ideas, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, I was thinking some different ideas, though. Um, one is, you know, survey after survey that showed that asked officers like, "Why did you get into this work? Why did you get into policing?" Their the the number one answer is because they want to help, and I think that departments need to tap into that desire to be helpful that initially brought officers, you know, into the profession of policing. Um, and working to you know, dismantle this idea of the warrior mentality that a lot of officers have and the you know, us versus them, that you know, they enforce the rules on people who they don't necessarily feel are the same as them. Um, so I think those are important goals to strive for. Um, a project that I'm really proud of in Chicago is a, com a pilot community mediation program so this allows people to meet with, meet with officers. It's a, a facilitated conversation. So to carve out time outside of the heated incident where they are equals, where they are, the power dynamic is gone, it's facilitated by two trained mediators, and the two people, or more, if there's more people involved, can meet as humans instead of as an officer and a person who has to follow an officer's instructions or reap the consequences. So the idea behind that is to, you know, they have two hours of time. The conversation can go almost anywhere it needs to. And I know the question asked, you know, that uh, we hear often about civilians being told to emphasize with police officers, but this is certainly going to be, you know, an outcome of that is they can talk about how they experienced it, what they were feeling, what they were thinking during the incident. 
Um, and I can only imagine, you know, how powerful it would be for a police officer, you know, in a calm moment where they're not under stress, there's no safety concerns for any of the people, but to hear a person say, you know, do you know how it felt to me to be talked to like that in front of my kids? You know, do you have kids? You know, how would you feel if someone was completely undermining you and, you know, treating you the way that you treated me and have your kids see that? You know, those sort of conversations can occur in this safe space. So mediation as uh, something to develop and something to work towards is something that I would definitely consider as a way to um, give officers that space and time to really understand how people on the other side of the encounters experience those encounters with them. Thank you, Sherry. And thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Chris. We are finished with the questions. <laughs> um, for our audience, we have some flyers located at that exit on the table and at this exit over here on a chair that has a QR code so you can provide your feedback on, um, on the, the forums and the candidates tonight. For the folks who are online, we also have that QR code posted on the website um, that you should have had access to to access this Zoom link. So with that, I want to again thank our colleagues who've traveled far to meet with us this evening, and we've got a full day of interviews tomorrow. So thanks everybody who was able to come in person and for those of you who were able to join us online. Thank you so much.